Well, good morning, everybody. How we doing, all right? So good to see all of you. Thanks for showing up on this hurricane weekend. Uh, you're amazing. Just love you guys so much. So glad that you are here. We're going to have some fun today, all right? Uh, so we're going to have some fun today, all right? I know your church is... I think church would be fun around here. I got to tell you this story. It was two uh, summers ago. Uh, we were coming home from vacation. And uh, has anybody ever taken a vacation where when you get home, you, you realize you need a vacation from your vacation? You know what I'm talking about? We are like spent the whole week camping up in uh, Lake George. And, you know, it's a lot. It's fun, but it's a lot of work. You know, like three tents and a whole thing. And, you know, uh, it was just a five-hour drive home. We're all exhausted. And we pull into the driveway and open up the garage door, and I get out of the car and, you know, ready to unpack and do all the stuff you got to do, when all of a sudden this odor smacks me in the face coming from my garage. I'm like, oh my God, what? Like something died in my garage. And um, I was like, kids, hold on a minute. So I walk in, and I, I see it. We got a, a, a fridge and a freezer. I got, you know, uh, four kids and, you know, th- almost three teenage boys now. And so we need that capacity. And I see my freezer. There's like this red gunk coming all the way out into the garage. It's just like blood. And I was like, oh, my God. So I walk over to the freezer. I open the door. And this is what I saw. Our house had gotten struck by lightning, and my freezer went out and lost everything in it. But, I mean, I had a lot of meat in there. Like, we buy a, a quarter cow every year, I had two deer. In here. I mean, it was just, it was the most disgusting smell you've ever smelled in your life. I mean, I, if you know me, you know that um, I have a terrible gag reflex. Like, just anything just makes me, like, just, <laughs> I was like, and I was just like, I shut it. I'm, like, going to puke. <laughs> And, and my kids were like, we're out of here. They're like, we're running out of the front door. And, and Becca's like, I'll help you. I'm like, no, honey, I got it. I'm like, okay. She's like, okay. And she's standing there. And I walk over. I get a, one of those big, hefty black trash bags. And I start trying to pull this rotten, disgusting, bloody meat mess into the, And I'm just, I mean, I'm, just, I'm trying. I get the old college try. And to make matters worse, there's Becca just <laughs> laughing her face off at this whole thing. And I'm, I just can't do it. She's like, come on, get out of here. I'll, I'll do it. So I walk out. I'm like ready to puke. And there's Becca. Like, she's like whistling. She's just like, <laughs> doesn't even phase her. I'm like, what are you like superwoman? Like, what is the, how are you do? I'm still dry heaving in the driveway. I'm like, and she's like, she turns around. She's like, Dave, I grew up in Manila. Uh, in the Philippines as a missionary kid, I have smelled much worse than this open air street uh, meat markets and fish and all kinds of And so she has like this superpower. Nothing, you know, makes her just, you know, she's amazing. She's amazing. And so I'd have lost without her on that one. And um, it was just, it was just horrible. Uh, you know, uh, is there anything like, what, like makes you gag? Like it makes you just want to, puke, right? Like, I don't know, maybe it's, um, for you, it might be like changing a dirty diaper. Anybody know what I'm talking I'm so glad we are out of that phase in my house. It's the most, in fact, I came across some videos of some guys, some real men trying to change some dirty diapers. Let's watch it. Let's watch it. Come on. <laughs> Turn it up. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so funny. So what is it for you? What makes you gag? Maybe it's the smell of rotten eggs. I don't know, it might be anchovies. Uh, I don't know what it might be for you, but like what makes you just want to kind of just gag or puke? Now I know some of you are like, Pastor, have you lost your mind? Like, are we going somewhere with this? I promise you, we're going somewhere 
with this. You see, we're in this series right now. It's called Dear Church. And we have been studying uh, seven letters that Jesus himself wrote to seven different churches located in seven different cities in Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey. Um, his, one of his best friends, his disciple John, he, um, he wrote everything Jesus uh, said to him down, and these letters were sent to these different churches. Of the seven letters, only two of the letters did not include anything kind of negative that Jesus was saying to the church. It was the church that we studied last week, the church we'll study next week, um, or he didn't say anything negative. The other five, he had some pretty strong, honest, firm things to say. And today, um, as we study this church, and by the way, Jesus referred to these seven churches as seven golden lampstands, and here's why. Because Jesus wants his church to be a bright, shining light in a very dark world going through dark days. I don't, I don't know about you, that's the kind of church I want to be part of. A life-giving, light-bearing church, a beacon of hope and light to a very dark world. And so the, the, the church that we're going to study today is the church that was located in the city of Laodicea. And this is what Jesus says to them. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. It's pretty strong. Wouldn't you agree? Like, and we're going to study this letter, and and we're going to understand, like, Jesus isn't angry with this church. He loves this church. We're going to look at the tone of what Jesus has to say. It's not one that's like he's disgusted with them, and he's furious. No, no, no. It's it's one of love. But he does say, look, I'm kind of disappointed about what's going on currently in the affairs of your church. Like where you guys are at spiritually, right here, right now, Laodicea kind of makes me want to throw up. It makes me want to gag. It makes me want to spit you out of my mouth. That's what he says to this, this church in Laodicea. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And so I have to ask you this question. Have you ever considered it? What makes God gag? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what makes God sick? I can think of a couple things. One, and it's a really big one, uh, I think is self-sufficiency. It makes God sick. It makes him want to puke. makes him want to throw up. Have you ever been around a person, like, and I'm sure you have, they're, like, just so full of themselves, I mean, they like just, they got an ego the size of this room. They drip with arrogance. They're so full of themselves. They're blatantly narcissistic. It's all about them. And after you spend some time with them, you walk away and here's what you think. Man, she just makes me want to puke. He just makes me want to throw up. Well, that's how God feels in very much the the same way with our self-sufficiency. It's not that he's uh, uh, disgusted in the person. He's disgusted in the person's self-sufficiency. And if there was ever a city that was full of self-sufficiency and independence and and, and pride and arrogance, it it was Laodicea. Laodicea was was one of the uh, richest, wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire at the time. I mean, they had an amazing amount of affluence there. Uh, there was an enclave of millionaires that lived there. And this was not like old money millionaires that we see out in the Hamptons. This was like new money millionaires like up in Silicon Valley. Are you with me? I mean, these were entrepreneurs. These were hardworking people. They were smart people. And they made themselves and their city the envy of the entire Roman Empire. It was a very wealthy city, and they're so self-sufficient. In fact, if you read in history, um, there was a time where Laodicea uh, underwent an earthquake. And when, like, the FEMA of the Roman Empire showed up with all kinds of, you know, workers and money, they're like, no, no, we don't need you. Just go ahead. Go home. We got this. We will rebuild. We got all the money. We've got all the resources that we need. That's how wealthy they were. Now, their wealth came from three main sources. The first was fashion. It was the fashion industry. It was the capital of the fashion industry. See, outside of the city of Laodicea, they raised these um, sheep that produced this uh, black 
glossy wool. It was the envy of the world. It was, it was what was used to make all of the finest clothes in all the world. So Laodicea was like, it was like the Champs-Élysées. It was the R- R- Rodeo Drive. It was Saks Fifth Avenue. I mean, they were the trendsetters. This is where you got your Armani and your Prada and your Gucci and your Yeezys. They had it all. They were the trendsetters. Everybody was asking, hey, what are they wearing in Laodicea? The second thing they made their money from was medicine. You study history, the, you, you discover that the Laodicean doctors were the first doctors to develop this new ointment, this medicine that was used to put on people's eyes to cure them of many vision uh, impairments. Also, if you study history, the Laodicean doctors were the very first doctors ever in history uh, to perform successfully cataract surgery. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, not only a fashion, uh, you know, center of the world, but medicine uh, as well. And the third way they made their money was a highly developed commercial banking industry. It's kind of like New York City. It's a huge financial center of its day. So in the middle of all this wealth, in the middle of all this affluence, here's the church of Jesus Christ. And they start to flirt with this sense of self-sufficiency that runs rampant throughout the culture of their own city. And then Jesus says to them, you say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, I don't need anything, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Like you you say you don't need anything, but you don't even see your own condition. And the fact that they were wealthy wasn't the problem. God does not Say it's sin, it's sin to be wealthy. In fact, there was many wealthy people in the Bible, Abraham and David and Solomon and Lydia and Nicodemus, and God used all of them in a, in, in a, in a huge way. So wealth is not the issue. Self-sufficiency is the issue. They had let all that stuff deceive them into thinking that, hey, we got it all under control. We don't need anything. See, and wealth ha- brings with it this illusion that I can have security in my life without God. And Jesus did not want the church to fall prey to that. He loves them too much, so he says to them, here's your way back. I advise you to go buy uh, gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. He says, stop building your life on, on stuff that doesn't matter. Go after what really matters most in life. Uh, you know, uh, I know it's so tempting today, just like it was back in Laodicea, to fall prey to the myth that the, our culture still says today, the devil has nothing new up his sleeve. It's the same lie over and over again. And the myth today is the same back, hey, if I just had a little bit more money, then I'd be happy. If I just had a little bit more money, then I would be secure. Oh, if I just had a little more. Well, you know what? You should go home and read this afternoon, Revelation chapter 18. It tells us that all of our wealth, all our possessions, the wealth of the entire world, what, it exposes it for what it is. It's a foundation built on sand, a cheap substitute for real and lasting happiness. It's just a puff of smoke and it'll be gone like that. See, money is unpredictable, but God is not. Money's fickle. God is not. Money's deceptive. God is not. Money is unsatisfying. God is not. Money is only temporary. God is not. And Jesus, he just keeps saying, why would you build your entire life on something that's unpredictable and fickle and deceptive and unsatisfying and temporary when you can build your life and rely on a faithful, true, dependent, and trustworthy God? So I just want to tell you, you know, it excites me to be part of a church like this where I see so many of you, even as we go through a global pandemic, and so many have suffered not only the loss of loved ones, but the loss of a job and income and, you know, education opportunity. I mean, so much loss over the last year and a half, not to mention everything else we've gone through, but yet to see so many of you continue to step in. Uh, to generosity and to continue to understand that everything you have, it comes from God. It belongs to him, but it's only on loan to us, and he asks us simply to be managers and stewards of what he's entrusted to us and to watch so many of you, like we heard from John and Ada today, what a, like they move their family 
to the Poconos because of this church, because of the friends they found in this church, because they wanted to partner with a life-giving, Jesus-loving, hope-spreading church like this. And then after a year of being here, trying to find a job, trying to find a job, closed door, closed door, closed door, closed door, then God opens the door and blesses Ada with a job where she makes 12000 more, and her first thought was not, oh, I can go buy a new car, I can buy a hot tub. Her first thought, oh, now, thank you, God. Now I can do more for your kingdom through my church. I mean, who doesn't want to be part of a church like that? I want to be part of a church like that. I love that. To watch so many of you just having a blast, helping people, loving people, serving people, bringing them food, showing up at their house, praying for them, unleashing compassion for them in our community. I love that. And God put that in you. That contagious joy that you saw in John and Ada's, God put that in them. God put that in you. That sense that, man, we're made to give and live generously because we have a generous and giving God. And then Jesus, um, he adds this next uh, words to the church. He says, you know that black, glossy, really popular, expensive wool that you guys make? You're famous for it. How it's like the fashion statement for the whole world. Yeah, let me tell you, it's like so yesterday. And then he says this. Go out and buy some white garments. It's like it's time for a, a new wardrobe. You need to buy some white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. In other words, he says, church, listen to me. I gotta be honest. Your self-sufficiency is showing. This attitude, I don't, I don't need you, God. I don't need you in my business, in my finances. I got it. I'm good. Attitude, it's showing. And it makes me sick. The thought that you don't need me, the thought that you got it covered without me. Remember, they're living in the city with this new miracle drug, and these surgeries, they're helping so many people but then Jesus goes on and says, guys, you need to buy some new spiritual visine from me. It's an ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. Jesus is saying to the church, let me do some LASIK surgery on your heart so that you can really see, see yourself for who you really are so you can see the broken world around you and what it really needs for what it really is. Let me perform some surgery. You see, probably like you, I've learned most of my lessons in life, the big ones, the hard way. Can I get an amen from anybody else? Are you with me? All right. Yeah. Like self-sufficiency and independence, it will always leave you short-sighted. That's what self-sufficiency does. It impairs your vision. It leaves you short-sighted. You know how you can tell you're self-sufficient? Let me ask you a question. It's real easy. How's your prayer life? I mean, how is it? I mean, be honest. I know we're in church. We're not supposed to be honest. But just between you and God right now, how's your prayer life? It's the first indicator. I don't need God. I don't need to pray to him. I don't need to thank him for everything that I have. I don't need to ask him for the things that I need. When your prayer life goes through the tank, it's an indicator that you're self-sufficient. I don't need to cry out to him. I got it. I'm good. So you just hang out there and I'll let you know when I need you. It's self-sufficiency. It's an indication. So you'd, you probably never pray or you seldom pray. If you did pray, you certainly wouldn't pray a prayer like this. Oh God, search me. Know me. Reveal to me. Is there anything like out of whack in my life that's not alignment with your will for my life? Show me, God, so that I can fix it. Like self-sufficient people, 
They don't pray that prayer. They don't look to God and say, help me, show me. I want to be all in with you so if there's something, one little speck in my spirit that is self-reliant, independent of you, God, expose it to me. You know, the Bible says that um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know that? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of love. It doesn't mean that we have to be, we're supposed to be afraid of God. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, if God was not a God of love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness, there would be a whole lot to be afraid of when it comes to God. But that's not what the Bible says about God. The fear of the Lord, it's not about being afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is this deep sense of awe and wonder and worship that God is big and I'm little, that he's God and I'm not, that he has a, his ways are higher than my ways, his thoughts are higher than my, he has a bigger perspective, a bigger vantage point. He knows what's best for me in my life. And so I live every single day a life fully surrendered to God to his will, to his way, to his plan, to his purposes for my life, for my family, for my kids, for my job, for my finances, for my health. That's what the fear of the Lord really means and that is what is the beginning of wisdom. I love how Ellen Davis puts it. She says, the fear of the Lord is this deeply sane recognition that we are not God. That's good. You gotta screenshot that sucker right there put it on your home screen. The fear of the Lord is just the same recognition. We're not God. We're not in control. We don't just pull whatever levers or pulleys and do it all on our own. That's the beginning of wisdom. And when you get that, that's when life starts to make sense. So Jesus says, stop living in your self-sufficient, independent, you know, self-made, I don't need anything from you, God, attitude, and start depending on me. Start trusting in me. Here's the second thing that makes God gag. Indifference. Not only self-sufficiency, but this idea of indifference. You see, Laodicea was... It wasn't a dead church. It just wasn't a real thriving church. It wasn't like a comatose uh, church. It, it just wasn't taking any risks. It would be like, yeah, it's like a normal church. It's like a normal church where like, I go and I plug my kids into, my family into. It's, it, it's a normal church. They're, they weren't praying any dangerous prayers full of risks to take ground for the kingdom of God. No, it was just a bunch of Christians who were benign, perfectly content to cocoon with some other Christians for about an hour a week. You say, how do we know all this? Well, just look at how Jesus starts the letter. Here's what he says. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? So the angel, remember, is the messenger or the, the pastor of the church, right? These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. In other words, the first thing he says to the church is Jesus saying this. Like, this is who I am. This is my resume. I am the Amen. I am the faithful and true. I am the ruler of God's creation. So you better buckle up and listen to what I have to say because what I have to say carries weight based on who I am. And he says this, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. You're neither cold nor hot, but you're neither one nor the other. In other words, I, I know your indifference. I know your laissez-faire attitude. Not only your self-sufficiency, but your indifference. I know that you have this room temperature faith that's neither hot nor cold. And I, I, I wish you were either one or the other. And now here's where this passage takes an entirely different turn. Because here's what Jesus says next. So, because you are lukewarm, say that with me, lukewarm, say it again, lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Kind of makes me want to gag. Makes me want to puke. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth because you're not either hot nor cold. 
Now, I have to admit, and I could be wrong, it's been known to happen. That was a joke. Thank you for laughing, sir. Um, I grew up in church. I banked a lot of church time. Third generation preacher's kid. I've heard this preached a hundred times. I've preached this many times, this passage. You've probably heard this passage. And here's typically what the preacher said. And I got to admit, I've probably preached it this way when I was younger. The preacher would get up and say, he'll read this verse. You're neither hot nor cold, so I'm about to spit you out of the mouth. So the preacher would typically say, well, you know, here's what God wants you to do. He'd rather you be either hot for him passionate, fully in, unabashedly, unapologetically, live that fully surrendered life like I could preach the snot out of that. Or have nothing to do with him at all and just turn your back on God and just walk away. I've heard that preached many times. You've heard that preached many times. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I'll tell you why. Laodicea could brag about just about everything in their city. We've already talked about it. The one thing they couldn't brag about was their water supply. It was terrible, undrinkable. So they had to pipe their water in from two nearby cities. One of them was Hierapolis. Uh, Hierapolis uh, was known for its, its hot um, spas. I mean, you know, it's like, mind you, kind of like one of these guys, you know. People would travel all over the Roman Empire to go to Hierapolis to, to bathe in these hot spas and this hot water to, you know, heal the aches and the pains and the stress, you know, of life uh, at that time. So they'd have, through an intricate and very complex, uh, highly sophisticated aqueduct system, uh, they would bring in the hot water from Hierapolis. And the other city that they brought their water in was from Colossae. Uh, Colossae was known for its fresh underground, cold, refreshing spring water. Kind of reminds me of one of these guys. You know, so um, Colossae, I mean, if they could, if they would have had water bottling technology back then, they would have been bottling this water and selling it like banana. I mean, just, I mean, we wouldn't be drinking Perrier today. We'd be drinking Colossae today, okay? Um, And so they would then pipe this cold, refreshing spring, fresh water in from Colossae and this hot, therapeutic water from um, Hierapolis. And by the time that that water merged and made its way all the way uh, to Laodicea, guess what the water was? Lukewarm. Your faith, Jesus says, is just like your water. It's lukewarm. It's like milk that's been sitting out on the counter all night. It's like a bottle of Coke that's been left out all day with its cap off. You lost your fizz. It's lukewarm. It's room temperature. And I think what Jesus is trying to say to the church is, look, it's not either or. It's both and. I think what Jesus is trying to say to the church, there are times, church, when you need to offer the the hot, therapeutic healing power to people that are broken and hurting. Apostle Paul said it this way, with the comfort that you receive from God, with that same comfort, I want you to comfort others with. That if you've, if you've gone through some stuff in your life, if you've worked through some problems and some pain and some addiction issues and brokenness and family stuff and health stuff, and you then meet Jesus and you step into that warm, therapeutic, hot, healing water, come on, of Jesus, and he washes over your life, and he brings healing to your broken world. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
It's like maybe if you've ever like been skiing all day or working all day and maybe all week and you're all stressed out, your body and your muscles ache and maybe you go to a spa and you step into one of these suckers and it's just like, oh. Anybody know that feeling? Oh, it's healing. It feels good. It gives me hope. It gives me rest. And sometimes, church, that's what you need to beat a broken, hurting world. But then other times, you need to offer a cup of cold water. Refreshing. Remember, it was, it was in John's gospel, I think. John chapter 5, Jesus meets this woman. She's a sweaty mess. It's out in the middle of a hot day. The sun's high in the sky. She's out getting water by herself. Because he's Jesus, he knows everything about her. and He knows she's been through five failed marriages. Not one of those men could quench her thirsty soul. And the guy she was shacked up with now, she wasn't married to, and neither could he quench her thirsty soul. She's getting some water, and Jesus looks at her and says, let me give you a drink of water. Because he didn't just call it water, he called it living water. Because he goes, anybody who drinks of this water, they will never thirst again. And in that moment and in that in that state that she was in, she found a, a relationship with her Savior, Jesus Christ. And she went on to tell everybody how Jesus had quenched her thirsty soul. And she begins to offer that cup of cold water to many other thirsty people in her city. And what Jesus is saying, look, we need to be both. We need to be both. Offering a hot therapeutic spa treatment to somebody whose life's been blown up from COVID, whose marriage has been blown up from divorce, whose family's been blown up from the effects of depression and anxiety and mental illness, whose life has been blown up because they lost their job and they're going paycheck to paycheck and now they don't even know how they're going to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. They need someone. And I love that being part of a church like this because you go out there every single week and you find these people and you love them and you pray for them. You unleash compassion on them. You take them food. You go to the hospital. You go to funerals and you talk with them and you give and you're so generous. That's what Jesus is saying. I need you to be that. But then I also need you to be this. Like you ever been out in the hot sun like it was two weeks ago? It was like 100 degrees. It never gets to be 100 degrees in Poconos. That's why we live in the Poconos. But it was hot, wasn't it? You ever been out working in this hot sun, maybe in your garden or mowing the lawn or just outside working and you're just so thirsty and then somebody walks up and offers you an ice cold bottle of water. You take a sip of that, it's like, oh, that tastes so good. Oh, it's just what I needed. And it's the same way that we need to do for people who are lost and hurting and so thirsty. And all of us, just like that woman, we're looking to things in this world, this relationship or this achievement, this amount of money, this kind of car, this house, the shoes that I wear, looking, and they never fully satisfy. And I'm so glad to be part of a church as we go out into the world, this is what we do. We offer cold, fresh, refreshing, living water. And sometimes we offer hot, therapeutic, healing water to those who are in need. I think that's what Jesus is really saying to the church in Laodicea and to us. Either be hot or be cold, but don't be lukewarm. Don't be indifferent. Let me open your eyes because you're blinded. Let me perform spiritual surgery because you cannot see yourself and your faith for what it is, and you cannot see. You're blinded to the brokenness in the world around you, so let me open your eyes so that you can truly see Laodicea. Because all of this self-sufficiency and all of this self, all of this indifference, it's not my Father's will for you. It's not his best for you. Now, I think I would do all of us a disservice and if I just prayed and let you all go home thinking, 
Well, I used to go to one of those churches. I've got family members that still go to one of those churches. We can even point our fingers at other churches in the community and say they're like that church. And I think if we do that, we miss the point. We miss the application for our own lives and for our own church. So I want to ask you, what do you think God is trying to say to community church? Be a little more personal. What do you think God is trying to say to you You remember Larry Waters, story of Larry Waters? It's a true story. Absolutely true. I remember it. Larry Waters, he was an out-of-work truck driver. He lived in L.A., right in the LAX flight path, where planes would come in and take off from LAX. And uh, Larry would sit out in his yard every afternoon in his chase lounge chair and crack open a beer, and he'd watch the planes take off and land. After doing this for quite some time, Uh, Larry began to dream about what it would be like to fly. So then Larry hatches this plan. He takes his lawn chair, he tethers it to the ground with a rope, and then he attaches 35 weather balloons to it filled with helium. Anybody remember this story? Some of you? His plan was um, he would just cut the rope, he'd, you know, fly up a little bit. He he had to, sat down in his lawn chair, he had a six-pack of beer, he had a BB gun, and he had a CB radio. And his plan was he would just cut the rope, fly up a little bit, you know, float around, wave hi to his neighbors, and then he would take his BB gun and start shooting the balloons, and then he'd just gently drift back to earth. Larry was completely unprepared for what would happen. As soon as he cut the tether, he soared up to 11,000 feet right in the middle of the LAX flight path. Can you imagine flying into LA, looking out the window? Hey, there's a guy in a lawn chair (laughs) with balloons attached to it. So Larry gets on his CB radio, shuts down the whole airport. It's a massive media, you know, frenzy. And the uh, FAA, they talk him down. He starts shooting out the balloons and he eventually floats back down. And right there was the media waiting for Larry. They asked him three questions. Now, Larry Waters was, uh, he was a, a man of very few words. So the first question they said, was, were you scared? He said, yep. Would you do it again? Nope. Larry, why did you do it? Here was his answer. He said, well, you can't just sit there. You can't just sit there. What do you think God is saying to you? What do you think God's saying to us, our church? Here's what I think he's saying. Church, you just can't sit there. You just can't sit there. I know it's hard. I know life has not been easy the last 18 months. Our whole world has been turned upside down. I know the rage. I know the anger. I know the fear. I know the hardship. But church, listen to me. Followers of Jesus, listen to me. Church of Jesus Christ, listen to me. Community, church, you can't just sit there. You've got to rise up in faith. You are the church of Jesus Christ. You've got to keep your faith and your trust in a reliable and faith-worthy God. You can't just sit there in your indifference and your self-sufficiency and make God want to gag. No, you've got to get up and be the church. And that's why I'm so glad. I even see so many of you here today and so many on the other side of this camera today in the middle of a hurricane weekend. You showed up because that's what we do here at Community Church. We show up and we stand up 
and we serve and we park cars and we change dirty diapers and try not to gag and, and we uh, serve coffee and we greet one another. We pray for one another. We lead small groups and we, we serve and we give and unleash compassion. Here's why. Because we can't just sit there. It's not in our DNA. It's not who we are. As fully surrendered followers of Jesus Christ, we have a mission and Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm not going to sit there in fear. I'm not going to sit there as a victim. I'm not going to sit there in my own self-reliance. I'm going to stand up and make a difference for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is forcefully advanced by men and women who lay hold to it. Church, we can't just sit there. Not on my watch. Not on your watch. We're going to stand up. We're going to be faithful. We're going to show up. We're going to pray. We're going to love. We're going to grow. We're going to lead. We're going to serve. We're going to give. We can't just sit there. I think the second thing Jesus is trying to say to us is we need to be cool and refreshing and warm and therapeutic because the stakes are incredibly high. Friend, listen. Oh, that God would give us vision to see. That he would illuminate the eyes of our heart, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, so that we could see what's really going on. This is unprecedented. And you get to be here on earth when it's happening. A global pandemic. It's not just affecting America. It's the whole world. Economies, supply chains, nations. The whole world has been impacted by it. What's going on in Afghanistan right now? Going door by door, the Taliban. If you have a 12-year-old or younger daughter, they are taken from you. Kidnapped, forced to become child brides. Men and women, because they love Jesus, are being slaughtered today. This is not like 100 years ago. It's happening now. What's happening in Cuba? What's happening in Haiti? What's happening in our own country? Floods and fires and storms. Jesus said, this is what it's going to be like before I return. And I don't know about you. Maybe I'm just unsophisticated or, you know, too naive, but I still believe the words of Jesus when he says, look to the sky. I'm coming back soon. I'm coming back soon. In other words, friends, listen to me. Wake up, O sleeper, Paul says. Strip your life of the self-sufficiency and indifference and live every single day with a sense of urgency for the stakes are high. Eternity hangs in the balance right here in our own backyard. The amount of of suffering and hurt families are going through and the addiction issues, the, 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 the drug epidemic, the rate of divorce, the rate of counseling skyrocketed since COVID. What's going on in kids and uh, the reports of, of kids and the, the, the number of abuse that's happened, it's, it's off the charts. Just read the police reports. This isn't like somewhere else. This is, this is right here. Church, if we don't do something about it, who's going to do it? I'm certainly not waiting for somebody else to come along. I'm not waiting for the government to come along. We're the church of Jesus Christ. And we understand the stakes are high. And so we need to, at times, offer that cup of cold water, refreshing, living water that will quench every thirsty soul. And at times, offer that therapeutic hot water, spiritual spa treatment for those that are hurting and broken because the stakes are too high. I believe that God has great things for us to do as a church, that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. And we're going to talk about that vision in the coming days as we go into the fall that God has called us to be a church that is making a difference for his kingdom so that he receives all the glory, that this is a church that is for the Poconos because God is for the Poconos. This will not be just one church of a thousand. This will be 
a church of thousands with meeting in multiple locations throughout Monroe County and I believe even one day in, in Lehigh Valley. And here's why, because there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands who are lost and hurting and broken and need of the hope and the forgiveness and salvation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The people who are isolated and in need of community can find real friends right here. The people, if they just knew the God that you knew and the God that I knew, that they'd fall madly head over heels in love with him just like we did. The stakes are just too high to sit back, do nothing, play it safe, try to keep the lights on. Come on. That's not who we are. It's not who you are. I close with this. Here's the last thing Jesus says. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Isn't that beautiful? He's like, gang, look, I correct and discipline everyone that I love. This, I know this letter is it's honest, it's firm, it's direct. It's corrective. But I do that because, not because I'm mad at you, because I love you. It's the same way you discipline your own kids. Because you love them. Because you want what's best for them. Am I right, Mom? Am I right, Dad? Because you love them. You discipline those that you love. Because I have so much more for you. Life has so much more for you. So be, del- be diligent and turn. Do something about this self-sufficiency. Do something about this indifference. You don't have to stay there. This is not an irrevocable decision. You can change. You can turn. You can go in a new direction. You can think differently about God, about what's going on in the world. You can turn from all that. Look, I'm standing at the door and I knock. I'm knocking. And I'm extending this beautiful invitation. If you just hear my voice and open the door, there's an openness, there's a willingness. I don't care how jacked up or messed up you are. Look, I'm going to come in. We're gonna do, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to shower you, lavish you with my love and my compassion, and I'm going to restore you and strengthen you. Then I'm going to use you to bring that love and transformative power to those that you know. Uh, I, I want to do life with you, and we're going to be friends. By all rights, shouldn't we be the one knocking on his door like oh dear God forgive me oh God I am so sorry for my indifference I am so sorry for my selfishness I am so sorry for my self sufficiency I am so sorry for pushing you out and not to rely I'm so shouldn't that be what's really going on but it's the other way around because we have such a wonderful savior and he stands and he just politely knocks And if you'll just open the door, he will do his part. But you've got to do your part. You've got to open the door. You've got to turn. You have to repent, which simply means change your mind. It's a positive word, not a negative word. Start heading in a new direction. Start thinking differently about yourself and your life and your past and your brain, your problems, what you did, and what's happening, your shame, your guilt. Just start, just turn from that. Turn to God. That God, you're good. You've got a love and grace and mercy. You've got a second, third, and fourth, fifth chances. So as best as I can, as best I know how, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to go all in. I'm going to live my life for you, no longer in fear. I'm going to put my trust in you. I believe God has so much more for you. I believe God has so much more for this church. I believe God has so much more for this community. Can you, Im- yeah, go ahead. Come on, you believe that? Imagine what would happen in the Poconos if everyone in our church decided to live a fully surrendered life for Jesus Christ. What if we all did that? 
Make a decision to pursue it. I'm not saying be perfect, just to pursue it. Like tomorrow you're going to wake up 15 minutes early. Make a little pot of coffee or tea and spend a few minutes reading God's word in prayer. Write a few things down. We call it a soap journal. What you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Walk in obedience to that. What would happen in your life, in your family, in your marriage if you started doing that? What would happen if all of us Every week we were in town, just showed up or logged on. What would happen if when we showed up, we had a friend on our shoulder that we said, come sit with me? What would happen if all of us decided, hey, it's time for me to start using my gifts and be a a contributor around here instead of just being consumed with my own self and make it all about me? What would happen in our church if you joined a serve, if every single person joined a serve team was willing to serve twice a month? What would happen Every single person in our church decided, you know what, enough of self-sufficiency and I'm so important and I, and I don't have time and I can't get any more than an hour a week to the church. What if we all decided, you know what, I'm going to take the next step and I'm going to join a group and I'm going to find a new circle of friends. I'm going to find some people that are going to encourage me, do life with me and, and challenge me to help me grow in my faith with Jesus. What would happen in our church and in our community if all of us decided to step into generosity, step back into generosity, step into a new level of generosity around here, became a generosity rock star? The amount doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. It's just the attitude of your heart to say, I recognize everything I have. It comes from you, God. It's just on loan to me. I'm going to be a manager and steward of it. And I'm going to be a, a giver and not a taker. What would happen in our church if all of us just did that? At whatever level, God leads you to do that. What, would ha- what resources could be released in the middle of a global pandemic that would make a difference for the kingdom of Jesus Christ right here in the Poconos and on down into the Lehigh Valley? How much faster could that happen if we all did that? I mean, just imagine. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. What a beautiful image of hope. What if all of us decided to take that love and that grace and that forgiveness that we've offered, that we've been offered by Jesus, we've experienced, and we take it to a lost and hurting and broken world? What difference could we make together as a community right here in the Poconos? That we would serve and love, unleash compassion so that God would get all the glory and it would lead to the souls being saved. I can imagine it. Can you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. For the grace you've given me to hopefully present it in the spirit in which you first wrote it. That you write this to us because you love us and you have so much more for us. That you want to bless us. That you want us to live with your favor, the hand of your favor on our lives. That we wouldn't sit around and do nothing and be self-consumed and live in fear or indifference and be blinded to our own spiritual condition or to the condition of our broken world around us. Oh God, speak to us. Oh God, show us. Oh God, give us the courage to do what you're calling each of us to do. And as you bow your head, as you pray, I mean, maybe he's asking you, you just need to take your next spiritual step today. I don't know what that might be. It might be stepping into a serve team. It might be deciding to read your Bible, start praying again. It might be to keep a, a, a spiritual journal. It might be to, you know, join a group. Get in community around here. Engage. Step into generosity and start giving or start giving again. Or to increase your levels of generosity. Whatever it is, be obedient to that thing right here, right now. Because I want you to know God's blessing for your life is on the other side of your obedience. He has so much more for you for your family. He wants to bless you, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, your health, your body, your mind, your home, your finances. He wants to bless it all so that you and I will be a blessing to others so that he will get all the glory. God, give your people courage today to do what you've told them to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this together.